what's up people today we got one more quick car edition and I actually decided to do this one because I'm getting kind of more involved in this um, pretty much video or vlog thing and I'm looking more into what the aspects of building the brand building the community and all that good stuff is all about well today I actually looked into my discussions area because a, a few months ago I posted a question and at this point the question is kind of irrelevant but there was this young lady San Fran girl 1982 and her name is Elizabeth Elizabeth H not sure what the H is for but Elizabeth is a paralegal she got her certificate from San Francisco State University well in the spring of 2013 why did I bring that up what relevance does it have to today's discussion her comment as a paralegal brought up a situation that was also brought to me on last week regarding a subject that I wasn't going to get into yet but I'm going to address right now partially San Fran girl 1982 or Elizabeth stated in her comment nobody believe anything on this man's channel he claims to have won multiple cases and picked juries and taken depositions but he is in fact not an attorney and only attorneys are permitted to handle such responsibilities. He is a fraud, so do not believe a word he says. That to me is absolutely amazing. Simply because she used the words only attorneys and permitted. Now, the first thing I'm going to address real quick is the fact that she goes, don't believe him because he's a fraud. Here's the easy to address that. At the beginning of each and every one of my videos, yeah, my videos, the big tall guy that's bald, standing in the courtroom in a shirt, tie, suit, that's me. The guy that you see questioning witnesses, that's me. It's easy enough to understand my knowledge began because I was charged with the RICO statute prior to even there being a RICO statute in the state of Georgia but I was charged with the racketeering statute in Georgia multiple counts and regardless of how it ends or if anybody likes it I did not have anyone representing my interests in that matter and it's at the beginning of every video the funny part about her statement only attorneys are permitted to handle such responsibilities I'm gonna go back real quick because I San friend girl and my first encounter with her was in a I guess comment section or chat room in which a young man had a conversation with the judge and I stated in the conversation he was correct in what he said the manner in which she handled it or addressed it was incorrect and the statement he said was that the judge was a servant which is true San Fran girl 1982 stated that the judge is the most powerful person in the courtroom now here's where I guess the the animosity came because I asked questions the question that I directed towards San Fran girl was how was the judge the most powerful person in the courtroom her response was oh come on you already know they are so here here's what's funny the judge has an oath of office to just to defend and support the Constitution of the United States of America which is a trust document a trust documents meaning that the Constitution is set up to protect the God-given rights 
of the common man or the civilian, the public, which the young, young man is a part of, you and I are a part of, and that makes the judge a servant. So if I have to get permission to defend myself from the rights that God granted me, who do I ask the, for permission from? Do I ask the judge? No, because the judge is a servant. Do I ask the bailiff? No, because we know the, the bailiff takes an oath of office to be a public servant. So do I ask my servant for permission? No. Do I ask the prosecutor? Because the prosecutor is only there to represent the interests of the people, which I am the people. So the prosecutor is also a servant to me. So do I ask the prosecutor for permission to defend what God gave me? Don't worry, I'll wait. No, because they're serving as well. So if I have counsel, because counsel is only there in advisory capacity. So therefore, they are, ser they are servants. So do I ask my servant for permission to defend what God gave me? No. So if the judge is a servant, the prosecutor is a servant, anybody that I have on my team is a servant, who do I ask for permission? Don't worry, I'll wait. There was no response because, again, the most powerful person that's in the courtroom is the quote unquote defendant. Now, if, if you are allowing them to consider you a defendant, if you look in contract law or if you look at any pretty much form of law, defendant means contract, means there is a civil issue. And if you go back and review my case, my racketeering case, we were not referred to as defendants. We were referred to as the accused. There was no state. It was John Melvin, the accuser, versus the accused. But I'll, again, those are things that I'm going to get into later. But now I want to I want to read something because again, only attorneys, those were her words, are permitted. But we can't figure out who we get permission from because everybody that's there. Our servants, they've actually signed a document that st stated that they will continue their servitude. Let's see, maybe it's in the Constitution. So if we look at the Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecution, the accused, there's that word again, shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district where the crime shall have been committed which district shall have been previously ascertained by law and to be informed by the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process by obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Here's what I find interesting. At not one stage in this constitution does it state attorney so now you have a person whose primary job which is shocking to me is to do research on nothing but law for actual attorneys and her mindset is that someone needs permission from a servant to do something that God granted them the right to do then we look at the contract, which pretty much outlines or announces those restrictions that are placed upon government that reinforce the rights of man. And nowhere in it does it say attorney. The more profound aspect of this is that there were 40 people that signed this trust document. 13 out of the 40 were attorneys yet the word attorney never appears in this document and instead of attorney they use the word counsel now a couple videos ago and you're probably gonna hear me say it a lot I talked about 
using your words because words have power. The fact that they never used attorney should illustrate to this young woman that attorney has nothing to do with court or rights. They use the word counsel. Now, I'm going to go into a court case, Supreme Court case. It's Chandler v. Fretek, 348 U.S. 3, 1954. His right to be heard through his own counsel is unqualified. Now, when you look at it, and we look at 1954, we also go back into, I told you, first, second, third edition, Black's Law Dictionary. First, second, third edition, Boiver Dictionary. Or a first, second, third edition, Ballantine Law Dictionary. Unqualified in Black Law Dictionary reads as unrestricted. Now, the reason why I brought that up is because when you look look at counsel is unqualified, counsel is unrestricted. If my counsel is unrestricted, that means there are no limits on what my counsel can do. He has to believe I have no limit. An attorney has limits. An attorney's first right is to show allegiance to the club, which is the bar association. Although they have a document that states they are servants, that they've signed at some point that state that they are servants, they still have a first mind for the bar because just like the NFL, the NBA, NHL, MLB, all of them are clubs. Everybody's first action is for that club, not for the people. When I have the choice of who it is, even if it is myself, I can still attain discovery. I can still cross-examine witnesses against me. I can prep. I can use character witnesses. I can bring up experts. I can do that. Guess what? The judge had no issue with me picking Wadir. And it's not her or his choice. And the greatest fact about that is the Constitution safeguards one choice of one's choice of counsel not the quality of counsel that one is chosen as counsel. And like I said, the role of any counsel, no matter who it is or what it is, is strictly in an advisory position. So whether you hire an attorney, which makes him your employee, or they appoint you a public defender, the public defender works for you, the public. Most people don't understand that. They're there as an advisor. They have no authority unless you give it to them. Here's where it gets funny because the choice of counsel actually comes from U.S. v. Gonzalez Lopez, 548 U.S. 14 2006. If a judge is to follow the ideals of San Fran Girl 1983, only attorneys are permitted to handle such responsibilities. According to United States v. Gonzalez Lopez, it's a violation of due process and a deprivation of rights because it's not the judge's choice. A servant can't allow the master permission. I don't need permission from anybody to do anything because God has granted me those rights, not man. Man can't give me rights. Man can't take them away. And a servant is only there to protect my interest. That brings me to Schwar v. Board of Examiners, 353 U.S. 232, 1957. A state cannot exclude a person from the practice of law or any other occupation in a manner or for reasons that contravene the due process or equal protection laws of the 14th Amendment. It goes on later to say in 353 U.S. 239, whether the practice of law is a right or a privilege need not be determined. It is not a matter of state's grace 
and a person cannot be barred except for valid reasons. If the state cannot say I can or can't, if the state cannot stop me from doing something, if this document states that I am my own person until, who do I get permission from? San Fran girl, 1982, whose job, her actual job, is to write down and research law. But everything that I'm reading that you can go look up states the exact opposite. And this is her profession. And one of the cases that a lot of what I'm stating comes from as a premise, as a base, is Adamson v. California, 332 U.S. 46, 1947. This case is one of the main cases in the Selective Incorporation Doctrine because this reinforces the 14th Amendment on the state. If the state has a statute and the statute itself violates the natural right of a person to do business and engage in his trade or vocation, which also includes the unlicensed practice of law. And here's the bigger thing. There is no license to practice law. There are only contracts that give someone the agreement to do work for you. You become an employer. You employ them when you pay them for services as well as Adamson v. California is also one that illustrates that state statutes, codes, ordinances, policy, public practice are subordinate to federal code, the Constitution, and Supreme Court cases, which make the supreme law of the land the Supreme Court cases, the federal code, and the Constitution of the United States of America. You know, that document that men and women have suited up, went to other countries, and fought wars for, to protect and defend. And as long as that is happening, there is no right that I feel I could give up, even the sixth one, just because a young woman has the audacity or not even the correct mindset to believe that it's okay for somebody to die and I give that one up. We'll keep the rest of them, but they can die for that one. That's okay. It's not okay to me. They defended. They lived. They bled for that. So we could enjoy that. We can enjoy the rights that God gave us. And to give one up for any reason is not okay but it also goes back to the system itself they want you to believe that you have to ask permission to be a human being they want you to believe that the judge is an authority when in fact the judge is a mediator the judge is a servant everyone in the courtroom is a servant Police officers are servants. They sign documents to prove that they want to be servants. They want to serve you. What happens here is when you look at only attorneys are permitted to handle such responsibilities. And it comes from someone that's not an attorney. And apparently not a very good researcher because that contradicts all law. I'll go into that later, too, because some, somebody caught that. Somebody caught me say all law. Understanding law is the power that you wield, not someone else. God gave you rights, gave them restrictions. They made a choice to be a servant. Continue to act like a master. And if you call yourself a king, act like a king. If you call yourself a queen, act like a queen. Put yourself in a king's position. Put yourself in a queen's position and you stay there. 
because most people want to be kings and queens until it's time to do king and queen shit. This is one of those instances where you have to understand competency is not a choice. It's an action. So to believe those on the outside that are going to tell you you can't do something simply because they don't like it or because they're, they are too lazy to know better. Because this information is freely accessed. Because I didn't ask permission to grab the law books. I did not ask permission to go to the library. I didn't ask permission to log on to DuckDuckGo. I didn't ask permission to log on to Bing. I didn't ask permission to log on to Google. I didn't ask permission to go sit in courtrooms. I didn't ask permission to go watch how, how attorneys do their job. I didn't ask permission to look through the federal code. I didn't ask permission to file any document. Because the question to me again is, who would I ask? And then the next one will be, if everybody's a servant that I'm dealing with, who can give me permission? Don't worry, I'll wait. Until next time.